Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker and as a committee, uh, as we began working uh, in looking at keynote speakers, uh, Dr. First's name uh, uh, came quickly to us and this was someone that I was told uh, that I needed to do my best to contact her and see if she could uh, join. And, uh, so I'm very pleased that she asked. She asked me to keep her introduction short. Uh, so uh, in your program you have a full, par full paragraph that lists some uh, of her achievements and what she is uh, involved in. But uh, Dr. Cynthia Furs is Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Associate Vice President for Research at the University of Utah. She wanted me to just mention uh, that she is uh, a uh, native to Logan and she is a true Aggie. Uh, and uh, you can assume all that goes along with that. Uh, we are so glad, though, that she is uh, here. We look forward to a hearing from her. She is going to uh, try and reserve some time at the end for some questions, uh, as well as following her presentation, uh, Travis Thurston from our Center for Innovative Design and Instruction will be standing up, uh, giving us some logistical announcements before the first breakouts that we have. Uh, during those breakouts, though, uh, Doc to first uh, mention that she will be available if uh, there are any additional questions uh, uh, for uh, her. So, again, without further ado, we'll turn the time over to Doc to first. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. I was really excited to come to this conference for exactly what I see, which is fabulous teachers from all over the state teaching almost every discipline to our local students. We all know what an incredible difference this kind of teaching makes to people's lives and the fact that you can teach a student to have a skill that they so desperately need for themselves, for their family, and for our state. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, let me pull up this PowerPoint. And this is the subject of my talk. A busy professor's guide, I think that applies to everyone here, to sanely, hopefully, flipping your classroom. This is one of my classes. So how many of you have heard about the flipped classroom? I'm delighted to see almost every hand up because only three or four years ago, that would not have been the case. But now the flipped classroom has been all over the news. But you've heard about this stuff before, so you ought to be feeling a little bit, huh, I wonder if this is just the next buzz. We, of course, know about traditional classrooms where we lecture and students respond with questions. We've heard about hybrid teaching, technology assisted, and so on. So what's so special about flipped? Beyond the buzz, there are several important pedagogies that are known, proven educational researchers at USU and others have been able to validate that certain different kinds of pedagogy increase students' learning. For example, active learning is well known to increase the amount of material that students are able to remember and their pleasure with learning it in the first place. Active learning is a successful teaching approach. It's great. I tried applying it in my classroom. The trouble is I didn't have enough time. Okay, problem-based learning. I teach engineering, providing a good engineering problem. That definitely gets the students all excited. I wanted to bring that into my classroom. Bringing in real world applications in any discipline is fabulous. Supplemental instruction, that's where you take a math class, then you get together with a TA afterwards, and you work through your homework typically. And tutoring and individual instruction. We know for a fact that these methods of pedagogy increase the amount of information that students can retain, and again, their pleasure in learning it. The trouble is, these things take time in your classroom, and the, uh, the latter two, supplemental instruction and special tutoring, require more people, TAs, and that's money. So it's a fight between wanting to bring these pedagogies into your classroom and the amount of time that you might want to give up in your class, is how a lot of us looked at it, and the amount of money that it may take you to do. So in order to get through that, I was teaching a very traditional class. I mean, electrical and computer engineering. These are the three classes that I've actually flipped. In 2007, I flipped a graduate senior level electromagnetics class, and I 
I did that because I really wanted to spend the time with the students struggling through the algorithms that they were working on. And so I flipped the class to buy myself the time to spend the time with my students in class. In a typical pre-flip class, I taught a good solid traditional class. I'm a good lecturer, the students listen to me, there was nothing wrong with my class. I do a good job teaching, in fact I was winning teaching awards. I had a 50 minute lecture, Monday, Wednesday and Friday, I had a three hour hands on lab. Most of my students, most of the students at USU and also U of U study alone. Right? They go home by themselves, they sit down with a book, they try to get their homework done, it's kind of hard. And they spend one to two hours for each of the times that I'm lecturing. So let's talk about this. Nice lecture, I'm doing a good job lecturing, but what are my students actually doing? Here's how I want you to think about it. Everybody look at the picture, you've got 10 seconds. Now, talk to your neighbor, introduce yourself if you haven't already, and I want a list of the things the students are doing in this picture. Quick, you've got less than a minute. I will try. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Someone tell me what the students are doing. Your table. They are daydreaming, not paying attention, and playing with their computer. I'll bet they are. Okay, someone else. I believe the young man on the back row with the baseball cap is asleep. The man in the back row with the baseball cap is asleep. He was up late last night. Okay, what else? What else are they doing? Talking to each other. Talking to each other. Yep, probably not about electromagnetics. Mm-hmm, yep. Um, how many said they were paying vast attention to the professor and gaining every bit of wisdom he had to offer? Okay. A typical lecture class means that the average adult attention span is 16 to 18 minutes. So of my 50 minute lecture, 16 to 18 minutes of that time was the time I actually had to give all of my gems of wisdom to my students. Why didn't we just have a 16 to 18 minute lecture period? Okay, this is what I wanted out of my class. There are many different reasons that you might change your teaching. The reason I chose to change my teaching is I wanted to raise students up the level of Bloom's taxonomy. If you haven't seen this before, the most basic kind of learning is just being able to remember facts. Frankly, they could have read my book and memorized the facts. Great. The next thing is understanding the facts. Probably doing the homework would have helped them understand those facts. Applying them. Maybe some of the more advanced problems in my homework would have helped them apply this information. But then, how about really analyzing this information? How many of my homework problems can I make deep enough that they really can be analyzing information? And I'm going to say it's close to zero in my case. Evaluating the information, and then most of all, I'm an electrical engineer. I want them to be able to design fabulous electrical engineering systems, such as antenna systems used in your, heart, in your cardiac pacemaker. How many times have I been able to actually do that in my class? That's where I wanted to drive my class to. There are other reasons you might be changing your class. Perhaps you want all of your students who are at the bottom not to fail. You choose the reason that you might change your class. Mine was, I wanted to drive up the level of understanding. Okay, so how can my students learn more? The best picture I could find here was a little bit blurry, but I will tell you. In a lecture, students understand and absorb and remember only a small portion of your information on the order of 5%. That's because they didn't stay awake the whole lecture. Reading, maybe 10%. If I supplement that with audiovisual, maybe we get to 20%. Demonstrations, 30 A discussion group, maybe you'll remember about half of that information. How about practicing by doing it? 75, and then if I were to teach others, maybe I'd remember about 90% of that information. How much of this am I actually doing in a traditional class? The first few bits. Okay, so 
What is known to improve learning? Active learning, problem-based, real-world applications, supplemental instruction, and working individually. These things are known to improve learning, and I wanted to bring them into my class. And I will tell you, I actually was trying very hard to do this in the traditional format. And what I found was I could spend five to 10 minutes each day with active learning activities because of the vast amount of fact that I had to share with my students via a lecture. Electrical engineering is not something that you can randomly discuss without learning the material to begin with. Right? It's not something you could just have a discussion about and learn. So what I did was I flipped my class. Flipping means that what used to be in the class, the facts, the lecture, is now outside of the class. And what used to be outside the class, the homework and the real learning, is now inside the class. So now the students watch, in my case, video lectures prior to coming to class. This provides the facts that they need. And then when they come into class, we can work together, we can work on real world applications, and we can do the active things that I really dreamed about bringing into my classroom. All I did was buy time. So just a really quick summary of how I did this. We have more information in the little uh, handout that you can join us for class to learn this in detail. But I basically made video lectures, one of three different ways, all of which have worked great. The first year I did this, 2007, my tablet PC, which was new at the time, was on back order. And I was not able to get it. So I used my little handheld camera and my whiteboard in my office, and I made my videos on whiteboard. Worked pretty decently, except that YouTube has this habit that it focuses in on everything that's moving like my hand and blurs out all the stuff that's holding still like the equations. <laughs> Oops, but still, it worked pretty well, and the students loved it. The next year, I finally got my tablet PC. You don't see my face in these tablet PCs. The students actually say it feels more intimate as if I were sitting next to them writing, as if I were writing for them. So surprisingly, even though they don't see my face, they feel a stronger intimacy, even than they did with the whiteboard. I've recently gone to also using a document camera because it is so fast, and because anybody can use it, because it only costs 75 bucks. And because if I want to do experiments, electrical engineering experiments, I can do it under the document camera. You can actually see what I'm doing. So these three tools have been my go-tos, and I use them whatever happens to be convenient. I put my information up on YouTube, and I put it up free, public, available to everyone in the world. I did this because I'm not just teaching Utah students. I feel very passionate about my area of expertise, electromagnetics, and I really do want to improve electromagnetic education throughout the entire world. That's part of my personal mission as a professor. So everything is there free and public. It took a bit of a gulp to put that up first because I might make a mistake and my colleagues might see that I left out a factor of two. And in fact, I do all the time, quite accidentally, like you will too. So I had to get over the fear of putting this up publicly, but it's been so worth it. And then I link my YouTube videos on Canvas, which you also use, to help organize my class for my students so they go through in the order that I want them to go through. I don't make them search YouTube. So that's how I do my technology. Then what I do in class is I try to have more than half the class active learning. I have no prepared lecture for any day, and the only lectures that I do are generated by the questions that the students ask during class. So they are just in time lectures. The thing I had to get over there was the fear of, what if they ask me something I don't know? Do you think they do? Pretty much every day. <laughs> So it's OK if I don't have the answer that day. If I think it's important, I'll bring it back the next day. And if I don't think it's critical to them, I'll just tell them, you know, that's not really critical. It's extra information. And you can come see me after class. We'll find some resources for you. So this is what I do in class. OK, so now I'd like to have you just kind of talk at your table. And I'd like to have you know, what would you, as a student, like about the flipped classroom? What would be your favorite things? I'm going to give you two minutes.
All right. This table right here, what is the most common reason you would like the flipped class? Don't listen to you. You're wrong. You're never wrong. No, you aren't. Of course you're not. Even if you made a mistake, it wouldn't be wrong. It would just be a misconception that no one else wants to have on the exam. We better bring that up so we make sure that we answer everyone's question. Okay, this table is talking about a health-related teaching thing where they must teach certain material. One of the great values of this is once you have prepared this must-teach material, you don't have to wonder if you might forget and leave something out. And if you did, you can go repair those for next year. So yes, having the material that, like, I have to get through these facts is fabulous. In fact, I feel that in my field, although it's not required, it's really common that once I've been teaching for several years, I may forget to say some important detail that's critical to the students doing their homework. I just forgot. This way, I never forget. The information is there, and you know that the lectures are good. If they aren't, you fix them for next year. And then she was saying they would like to use all of their in-class time to demonstrate the real cultural thing they do in their job, which is patient interaction, which is harder to demonstrate on video. And in fact, nursing and healthcare is one of the largest growing areas of the flipped classroom. You'll find a number of videos and video methods for teaching healthcare-related uh, material. Okay, what's another reason you would like the flipped classroom as a student? The fact that students can rewatch the video, they love. I would love it too. It's common that you think you understood what the professor said in class, but did you really? When you're starting try to try to apply it, you're like, what was that they said? So, yes, the ability to rewind the video in real time, like, what was that, is great. And you can't rewind a professor, they simply won't stop. <laughs> okay, one more thing. One more thing that you would really like about the flipped classroom. The students really do benefit, once they are able to manage their time well, to make sure like they can watch it all on the weekend or they can watch it all the night before. The reality is that the hardest thing for the students in my classes is the time management. So I try to provide them some resources and some recommendations to help them with that. So realize that's a challenge for them, but it's a tremendous advantage. Okay. I'm going to let my students tell with you what the they think about the flip idea, class. It, it forces me to study beforehand so that I can come up with a list of questions, for example, for Dr. First in the, in the next day's lecture. And then we can have this really dynamic classroom activity where everyone's contributing to the idea that was like presented. You know, for example, like how do you, you know, how do you um, write an equation for this electric field right here? And everyone can answer along with Dr. First. So it becomes a very, very hands-on activity, I think, in class, which typically it doesn't. What the videos do for you is you're able to pause something you didn't quite get, rewind it, and, and learn at your, at your own speed. And, and so that, that actually, I think, enables everybody to, to learn the material better, so pretty much normalizes the, the learning process. You're setting your pace. It's not the professor setting where... Oops. You're setting your pace. It's not the professor setting where... Oops, I guess that's as far as it went. Well, I think that it's forced me to be a good student because before I've even come to class, I've already done the lecture and my notebook is full of notes. And so then I'm just asking questions by the time I get to class. All right, for me, English is the second language. So if I don't understand very well the teacher or her accent, 
I can just watch the videos, I can activate the subtitles, so I can also see the written of what she's explaining about. Uh, I can really, really see the, all the drawings, or the graphics, or all the formulas she's writing, so I can will understand perfectly what's going on. And um, what I also think that in the videos, uh, she usually explains all the theory. So then when you go to class, you have all the theory knowledge, you take your notes, and then she starts to do all the exercises. So it's much easier and faster to understand this. The reality to my students is some of these guys watch the videos at chipmunk speed, and others, like this student, will slow them down so that they can hear it at a slower speed and often watch it with closed captioning, either because they choose to or, in his case, because he understands the written English language better than the verbal English language. I had not anticipated, when I made my videos, the tremendous opportunity that this provides to teach a wide variety of learners. I've also had a profoundly deaf student who said, it's the only time in his educational career he's ever been able to watch the lecture just like all the other students using the closed captioning. Previously, he would have been not limited, but he would have had the opportunity to have to hear a second translation through someone else and not straight from me. So the fact that he was able to watch these just like everyone else was very important to him. Generally, it's about half an hour of problem solving in the class. I like to leave about the last 10 minutes for talking about real world engineering applications. I love to bring stuff, you know, transmission lines or circuits or parts. Here's something real, and here's how your topic of the day applies to this real thing. I do. That's what I love about class. Okay, this is what the students told me in our standard teaching evaluations. You do them at the end of the semester, too. We're on a six-point scale, and my 2007, this was before I flipped this particular class, my evaluation of 4.98 and 5.13 is really good. This is being a good teacher, really excellent teacher. However, all I did was flip the class. Same notes, same exams, and identical homework. I didn't even change the homework. My numbers went up to 5.68 and 5.85, which is astonishing in teaching, in electrical engineering. Next year, these continue on. So the students really like the flipped class. Well, just because they like something, that does not mean that everyone likes it. This is another class, and it's showing you four weeks into the course what they thought about a flipped class. So this is really at the beginning for them. A little more than half say, yes, they like it. 35% unsure, 9% were negative. At the end, 65% said they liked it, 21% were still unsure, and 14%, that's more, didn't like it. Please don't think that you're going to please everyone with this or any other teaching method. Okay, it's fine that they liked it, but my job was to teach them more. Remember, that's why I flipped my class. When I looked at the test scores, it's inconclusive. Frankly, they did about as well as they ever did. But a reason for that is because I was testing only to a certain level. I was not testing higher order thinking because I wasn't previously teaching it. Why would I test something I'm not teaching? Now I am testing at a higher level, but I can't compare that to previous tests. So I can't tell you with test scores that they learned more, but I can with the questions in class. Most faculty, when they flip the class, will be astonished by the level of questions and the number of questions they receive, sometimes almost overwhelmed. The questions are no longer, hey, Dr. First, you left out a factor of two. Now they're starting to bring in, how does this relate to another class? My favorite question of all time, this happens every semester now, is they will say, these electric fields, they're not really real, are they? They're really just mathematical constructions, right? And the answer is, no, actually, they're real. <laughs> so I love being able to talk about that. The projects the students can do are at a much higher level than I could ever drive them before. I feel, I feel really good about that. And then the preparation for the next class. How many of us really know how well our students understood the material when they move along to our next faculty who's teaching the higher level class? Well, my faculty have come back to me, and I've had three different guys come back and say, 
I don't know what you were teaching those students, but they're doing so well. They were correcting me on this. <laughs> yeah. So the students are remembering this material to the next class, and my colleagues are noticing. That's important to me. I'm interested in how well this teaching helps students stay in the program, particularly our freshmen. That's inconclusive at this time. I haven't been teaching freshmen long enough. And then the alumni feedback. Many, many students come to me as I'm walking through L3, for example, where many of my students work. They'll come out all excited. Boy, what we did in your class, that has changed my life. I love the way I learn, do this. My portfolio is so good. So the students continue to use this material and often go back to the website to review. Okay, that's awesome. I do believe my students are learning at a higher level, but frankly, I'm also a selfish person, and I want to know what I can gain and learn from this. So here is one of the most important things. When we teach our students, when I teach my students, I look out while I'm lecturing, and I see if they look confused. You're all paying attention to me. I know you're listening. No one's asleep, I don't think. Okay? All right? You're paying attention. You appear engaged, and you don't appear confused. However, if I started speaking in a foreign language, you would quickly look confused and disengaged. We can see that when we're lecturing, right? I can too. But I was astonished when I started teaching a class that I hadn't taught before, freshman circuits, the most basic baby electrical engineering stuff, the most basic stuff, that there were a lot of things that the students were confused about. Not surprising, they are just beginners. But as I started walking through the class, when I, when I had you talking to each other, did you see I walked through the class, kind of looked at, and in fact, um, you weren't paying attention. And so I tapped you on the shoulder and said, hey, talk to them. That's what I would do in real class. So I was walking through the class. This puts me next to my students, looking over their shoulder at what they are writing down. And when they are confused, I know it in two minutes, not two weeks. It allowed me as a faculty member to realize that there were a number of things. I can list six in a basic electrical engineering class that are so key to our technology that we don't teach. The students eventually pick it up somehow, but we don't teach them. We don't write it in a book, but they are critical key concepts. I found those by walking through the class, and I was able to, I'd say this, invent ways to teach them. If we weren't already teaching them as a culture, it was time for me to figure out how. In this case, the students didn't understand how to put various circuits together into a system. We always thought they could. We always made them do it, and they had to do it on their homework. But they were just kind of muddling through. I, was a, I developed a deck of cards with systems on one side and circuits on the other that we could use to talk about the details of system design, which we had never taught in any book in the past for freshmen. So we've now added it to the textbook also. But this would not have happened if I had not been wandering through my freshmen going, what do you mean you don't understand what a node is? This is so basic. But if they're not understanding, it's because we didn't teach it. Let's take responsibility for what are called bottlenecks, which are the basic information that we may not be sharing with our students that are terribly important to our educational culture. The other thing that I've really enjoyed about teaching this way has been the global impact that I've been able to have. Here are some examples of the last 30 days of my YouTube channel. I could consider myself a YouTube diva at this point because about 40,000 people are looking at my videos about every month. Remember, this is August, and nobody, including me, has been teaching a class, which means people need this information and are out just to get it. What a cool impact for us as a university. Over 2 million views over the lifetime of my channel. The other thing that's been really cool has been the intimacy of the learning experience. Today, I'm standing up here. I am separated by about a three-foot drop from my students. But I can walk down and I can be with you and with them as we're working, and it feels good. It's an intimate learning experience for me and for my students, and it feels good. Remember, I want the one-on-one -on -one experience. But there are 120 students. I can't have one-on-one -on -one with 120, but I can have one-on-one -on -one with enough that I am picking up the questions from the bulk of the class, and it feels very personal, really, to all of us. 
My major method is, message is don't be afraid to reach out and touch your students. Don't be afraid to actually look over their shoulder at the homework they're struggling with and see what their problem is. This is not about being anonymous. I don't need to frighten my students when I look over your shoulder and see what you're writing. You're not really going to be intimidated by that because you know I'm there to help you. The fact that you weren't paying attention, I can tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, come on, work with these guys. Don't be afraid to reach out and actually intellectually touch your students. Okay. Now there's an elephant in this room. And I'm sure that many of you have some elephants in the flipped classroom room. So here we go again. I want you to talk to the people at your table and I want to find out what your, this is a teacher, there's teachers, what your biggest concerns are about flipping the classroom. See how many of these elephants we can find. Okay, are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. What's your elephant? Well, I, the thing for me is that you have to have a quorum of students that engage with this and come to class having actually prepared before class because otherwise, at least for me, it seems like you could sit there and in a class and just have it just fall absolutely flat, right? What if your students haven't watched the material before they come to class or read the book or whatever it is. That is a big elephant in the room. How many of you think, now I have a freshman class of 120 beginners. How many of you think half the students voluntarily with no quiz and no test will watch the videos? How many of you will give them 50%? You're optimistic. <laughs> You're saying zero. Okay, everybody hold up fingers. You've got one through 10 for the percent that you think the students will watch the videos. Hold up your hands. Vote with what percent. I've got 20%, 7%, 80%, 30%, Okay, you want to know the fact? 97%. Why do 97% of the students watch the video? When we ask them, it's because they say things like, I need to be prepared for class, because I want to ask a question, because the information is interesting to me. I want to be an electrical engineer. If you give your video enough value, the students understand the value proposition in their education, and they will actually go for it. What? Video, written material, whatever. Don't waste their time. Prepare something that is quick and important to them. So give your video or your written material enough value that they do this voluntarily. That's a good elephant. It's a big deal. If your students are not watching the material, not reading the material, it's because it didn't have the value. That's a very painful truth, and it's going to hurt. Figure out where the value is and make it more valuable. Okay, what's your elephant? I have a class of 500 students. It gets. <laughs> <laughs> a class of 500 students. It would be almost impossible to put them at little tables like this, wouldn't it? It's in an auditorium. There's a cool thing about an auditorium, though. Each of those 500 students has only two students sitting next to them. <laughs> so I've done this with a group as big as 120, because that's our biggest auditorium, and they only have nearest neighbors. It works almost exactly the same for me as a class of 20. So just realize that you're not going to do group work like this. 
Most of you weren't talking to the whole table, were you? I watched that. How many people did you really talk to when I gave you this exercise? And I'm sure the number is less than four. It's mostly two for most of you, maybe three. You could reach that far. So if you have a class of 500, what the heck? You still are only going to talk to two to four of them. And that's okay. All right? What's your elephant? I can't think of a good elephant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you said preparation. Just getting it ready. How many of you, for a 50-minute lecture, how much time, let's hold up fingers for hours, how much time do you spend today prepping for a brand new 50-minute lecture? One hour, two hours, three hours, ten hours. Hold up your fingers and look around. She's spending ten hours for a one-hour lecture. You're spending five, three, five, four, two. It's a substantial amount of time to prep a new class, isn't it? How many of you sleep? the semester you're prepping a new class. Oh, yeah. OK. Prep is an issue. So if I were prepping a class, oops, I guess I made my, somehow I managed to get all the way into my presentation. When I'm prepping a new class, I can allow myself about four hours, three hours, two hours to prep a 50-minute lecture class. Now, I may not be able to prepare video materials for every one of those classes, so here's my trick. Start your video lectures at the last one-third of your class, and not before. If you start at the beginning of the semester, those students are going to make you flip your class the entire semester. You will not sleep, and you will be an exhausted camel by the end of the semester. You'll be making camel noises that sound like, ah, ah. <laughs> right, it's too much. But if you flip the last third, the students will like it, you'll like it. The next year, you can flip the last two-thirds, and then finally flip the whole thing. Don't try this at home. Don't make your first class flipping on August 26th or whenever you go back to class. Start at the end of the semester. Yep, okay. Um, one more camel. Yes. Hey. I teach a, a different population. I teach a gen ed course, and I feel like I'm motivated and excited, and, and I buy in. I'm, you know, I, I love what I do, and I try to convey it to my students. But if I try to flip so that they're watching a lot of social media, you know, things, and anyway, they're supposed to do that at night. They come back. They don't. How do I make them accountable without making it a, a disciplinary kind of thing? Like you're going to have a quiz of five points tomorrow morning, so watch this. That doesn't seem like there's going to be a buy in to that. I just need some ideas. She has a really interesting problem. Let's give her some ideas. Anybody got an idea for her? Who's kind of close to me? OK. Well, I don't think flipping the classroom entails any different um, assessment that if we're having, we're instructing in class and then assessing afterward based on how they absorb the instruction, the assessment will be the same. Um, whether they learned it in class or out of class. And I, I think that's the harsh reality, like you've talked about. It's hard to deal with that, but I, I think that's the truth. I'd have to argue that the assessment's similar, but you're looking for a motivation to help your students look at this material when you don't think they're as engaged with your course as you are. Right? Because it's a gen ed course, I had to take gen eds too. I actually loved my gen eds. Some of them. Okay, so here are a few suggestions, and that's ju these are just suggestions. You're going to get more ideas as well. Some of the things that I do to motivate my students is make sure that the materials are very engaging to them and short. My 50-minute class actually only has about 15 minutes of video, total video for each day, broken into three to five-minute chunks. If I have reading material, it's two to four pages. It's not a lot. I'm not asking the students to spend 50 minutes like they would have in class. I'm very respectful of their time. I only want them to get the facts or the most important things. The other really key thing is I don't re-lecture when they get to class. If they missed the video, they are probably going to be confused. Life is rough. They can go back and read it later, see it later, view it later. It's a little bit of the tough love approach to teaching, kind of like parenting. So making sure that you don't redo material when they come to class, and sorry, Charlie, you'll just have to go look at it later, make the materials very compelling. Now, you saw the students say they came to class with notes. 
I let them use those notes on the exam and I do not let them use their book. They're actually writing their own textbook as they watch my video lectures. So that's another very motivational thing for my students. It could be for yours as well. The other thing that people are often doing is, yes, you can give a quiz. They can also ask people to post their own opinion on an online type of forum and give points for that. Canvas will let you do that automatically. You don't actually have to do any grading. So there are several things you can do to see to it that the students have watched the material in advance. But do realize, this is a different learning experience for your students. I need to go up and make this work again. Okay, so we did, ah. <laughs> I'm losing the technology battle today. Yeah, just join the club, exactly. But you're not going to probably remember my technology battles. Hopefully you'll just remember the exciting stuff we did. Okay, so we found a number of elephants. There are more. This is every professor's nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I post my videos, why should they come to class? Interesting experiment. The first year, I was actually making videos for a student who was deployed in Iraq. And the students asked, could they see the videos? And they quit coming to class, because I was posting the videos after class. The next year, I posted the videos before class. They all watched the videos go, oh my gosh, this is hard. I better show up in class. My attendance skyrocketed. So don't post the videos after class. The students will assume that they don't need to come to class, they can just watch the video. Instead, post it before. They're like, ah, I really do want to go to class after all. OK, so here's my big elephant. And we didn't pick this one up yet. Are any of you worried about job security? I've posted everything I know about electromagnetics on YouTube on the web. I'm serious. Why should the university keep me? And just run YouTube, right? They don't even need me up front. They can just hire a TA to kind of go around and help the students with their homework. Are we becoming dispensable or indispensable, and can I be replaced? My answer to that is I want to provide such huge value in the classroom that I am worth more to my students and the university than ever before. I want students from all over the world to want to come to my class because it is so awesome to be at the University of Utah in Dr. First's class. I want to raise my classroom value. That takes planning, thinking, and experiment. OK, so where am I most valuable? I think the place that I'm most valuable is in the active learning I can do in the classroom. I'm advertising this because August 31st, we're starting a class on Teaching Flipped. You are welcome to join us free, online. It's available to help you as a resource. teach-flip.utah.edu has the materials online permanently available to you and your colleagues free. If you go to CanvasNet, you can sign up. It's, sorry, they're in two different places. CanvasNet will be the active course running from August 31st for six weeks. OK, so here's how I would get started. The semester's starting next week. Eek, what do we do? All right, here's what I would do. Only two things this semester, two pieces of homework. One. Find some active learning exercises that work well for you in your classroom. You probably already have some active learning strategies that you like. I can already see that the workshops you have today are helping you with a number of additional active learning strategies. Find a series of a few handful of active learning strategies that you like in your discipline in your classroom. That's it. Experiment. The second thing is experiment with technology. Find some online resources that you like to use. If you're teaching a mathy subject like mine, I would encourage you to do a few videos that are examples, not full lectures, like an example out of the book. Or when you gave your first exam, and of course some students messed up, do the exam by video so that they can look carefully through and see what they messed up on. So that's what I like to do. Short videos that are not essential to your teaching, but get you used to the technology and get your students used to watching the technology. But they're supplementary, not essential. But if they are examples, the students will consider them very important, and they will hit your, your videos. So these two things are your homework for this semester. 
First week, get to know your students. They are cool and important people. I know most of you already do. What I do is I put online a Canvas um, survey, and it's not an anonymous survey, and the students fill out a few questions for me. I ask, why are you in electrical engineering? And what do you hope to learn? They'll tell me. What have you heard about this class? In the case of the freshmen, they had heard that it was a weed out class. It was important for me to know that walking in as a new professor to this class, because I had to tell them, this is not a weed out class. I've been put as your teacher because the department wants more of you to stay. This is a stay in class, not a weed out. I asked how they learned best. Oops, sorry. I said, tell me something non-technical about yourself. Much to my surprise, I had a lot of students tell me, I'm colorblind. That's a problem reading resistors in electrical engineering. I'm dyslexic. How am I supposed to teach them to read circuit diagrams? I'm autistic. I didn't ask them, what is your learning disability? But I got the full range. Now, what would you do if you saw that the first day of your class? Panic! <laughs> OK, what I did do is I went to the learning center and I said, help me. I need to know how to teach students like this. And they gave me fabulous resources I would never have thought to ask for. So find out about your students. Now, here are my personal favorite uh, active learning exercises. We've already done them here. One is think, pair, share. Pose a question. What would you like about the flipped classroom? Think about it. 10 seconds, share it with someone at your table. That's the think pair. And then share. We shared it with the whole group. Think pair share. You can do in any classroom instantly with no technology. It's very fast to come up with the ideas or the questions that are going to show up. So this is my think pair share. You can discuss. You can vote. You can use the clickers. You can use a discussion board. Lots of different ways you can get the information back. But what we did here in class is what I would typically do in class. That's my number one favorite. My number two is muddiest point or raise a question. I'm teaching stuff. I think the students understood it. But every Friday, I post an optional extra credit to explain what's the muddiest point, most confusing point, in class this week. Try to answer it. I can read through those in less than an hour, see how my students are doing, and if their answer is right, I can cut and paste it into a frequently asked question. If their answer is wrong, I can answer it myself, and I put those up for the whole class. It helps me a lot to know how my students are doing, and it helps them too. I will often do this in class too, because if I said, now you guys are brave, and we will in a minute, if I said, do you have a question, you're likely to raise your hand. But if you're a freshman the first week in Dr. First's electrical engineering class, and you think I eat children, <laughs> OK? Uh, you are not going to raise your hand, because you think over there, they might think you're stupid. You know that problem? If I say, so are there any questions? The answer is absolutely going to be, no, no questions here. Instead, I will say, please talk to your neighbor and come up with your biggest question. We did this with the elephant in the room. Come up with your elephant. Come up with your biggest concern. Then they don't feel stupid anymore, because if you two talked, you know that she doesn't know the answer and you don't know the answer. It's not a stupid question. I will get all the questions I need just by asking them to pose a question. My third is, of course, getting real. I love to bring real stuff to class. This group in health sciences likes to show students how to actually interact with patients. Each of us has a culture, whether it's accounting or nursing or electrical engineering or math or business or anything else, that is a culture we like to share and that we want to share with our students. That's what I mean by get real. I save the last 10 minutes of class almost every day to be able to talk about something real. It might be a piece of electrical engineering garbage that I can bring in, a broken antenna. It might be a video off YouTube, or it might be an experience from my own research. Creating your videos is actually really easy. After, at lunchtime, Nate from the University of Utah is bringing a whole suitcase of this kind of technology that you can test out here and see, would you like a tablet? Would you like a tablet PC? What kind of document camera you might like? Choose some kind of technology and just get used to using it. I use a screen capture called Ink2Go that's 1995 and as easy as push that button to record, push that button to stop, and upload it to 
YouTube and link it to Canvas. That quick and easy. So get used to using technology. And we'll have some here for you to try. But the semester's starting. And actually, I know we have at least one person here who is going to be teaching four new classes, or four classes. Eek! <laughs> That's a lot. It's very reasonable, very appropriate, and I would encourage you to use other people's material. Share this across the world. Create the ones for which you are the specialist and use other people's stuff. It works, it saves time, and it provides time for the active learning in class. But here is the what can go wrong part. If you are using my videos, teaching electromagnetics, I may teach things in a special way, a unique way, a different way. Many debatable ways to teach, right? Lots of different ways to kill this cat. Okay, so if I'm teaching this particular way in my videos, you better teach the same way in class if you use my videos. Do not use someone's videos and then teach a different way. That's what goes wrong. So watch the videos that you use. Put them on chipmunk speed and watch the videos. Okay, the other thing is feedback. Formative assessment is a blessing for our students. We give them information as they go along. Here's your homework score. You made a mistake. Here's your quiz score. You made a different mistake. Here's your exam score. What mistake did you make there? We give them formative assessment all the time. We ourselves need formative assessment. I would never teach a class, traditional, flipped, hybrid, or whatever, without asking for constant feedback from my students. I'm an experienced professor. I have been teaching since 1994. That counts me as old. But I still ask for feedback every three weeks from my students, asking them what I want to know. I do this in Canvas by putting in a non-anonymous survey saying, How, did the exam show you what you know? Why or why not? What can I do to help you learn better? What can you do to help you learn better? Ask your students what you want to know, anonymous or not, as you feel comfortable, but get feedback. This is a constant conversation with your students. I'm going to share an exam grading scheme that I have been using in my traditional classes and that I find invaluable in a flipped class. I give, in this class, let's say three midterms, and then I break the final into three sections that are basically retakes for those midterms. If a student did well on midterm number one and worse on the final, they get the highest of the two scores. There's no risk of taking the final and trying to do better. They blew the second midterm, that's a bad grade, but they did well on that part of the final. They had gone back and learned the, been motivated to learn the material and done well. Here they did very well on their third midterm. See, they're learning how to take tests. And guess what? They didn't do that part of the final. The nice part of that is the lazy professor's guide to teaching says, I didn't have to grade it. I end up only grading about half my finals which by the end of the semester is an absolute blessing. The students take only the parts that they want to take to replace their previous grades, which saves them study time and me grading time. My philosophy is that a student can do badly by accident. They can have a bad day, they can have the flu, their alarm clock didn't go off, or they just messed up on problem two. But they can't do well by accident. So if they demonstrated in that case, for example, that they did pretty well, I don't need to see it a second time. My material builds on itself. If they can do well on the final exam, the final part, they've done well on the whole class. So this is my grading scheme. It works really well and is very motivational. <laughs> Here's my bottom line for starting the semester. Relax. Give it a shot. What can it hurt? If you blow it, fix it. You know how to do that. Just relax, be yourself, and carry on. Now, are there any questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. Does your Ink2Go software allow you to put the captioning on? Does my Ink2Go software allow me to put the captioning on? Ink2Go captures anything that's on the screen. If I had captioned my PowerPoints, for example, the answer would be yes. But the best place to put the captioning is in YouTube. If you just Google how to close caption in YouTube, what YouTube will do for you is run a voice capture program and convert it to words, a portion of which are wrong. 
but it will let you go back in and edit, and then you say OK, and those become, become the closed captions for your video. So YouTube is the place to put your closed captioning, and just Google how to do it. Very good. OK, what's the role of my textbook? Well, first of all, having now written the textbook for this class, the making lots of money part is about 25 cents an hour. <laughs> OK, so the textbook for me is an absolute essential reference. The, most of the students, about 80%, watch the videos first, followed by reading the textbook, perhaps, or more often using it as reference. However, there is a portion of the class that prefers to read the book first, or in fact, read the book instead of watching the videos, which to me is a totally acceptable way to go. So the textbook and video have virtually the same information with me doing the interpretation for the students. So the textbook is a substitute for the video, if the students wish, and it's a reference material for everyone else. And I teach very much following my textbook. That's because I'm lucky to have a textbook I like. Good question. OK, so he's asking about assessing the higher level student learning, and do I have a plan to document it? The truth is that I am never, I'm never going back to not flipping. So I will not be able to compare a pre-flip to a post-flip. I feel, in my teaching, that that would be unethical, because I would be giving my students a poorer learning experience just to measure them. So I'm, I'm flipped now forever. I will not be able to compare my work going forward to a pre-flipped version. I am working hard to try to figure out how to assess the higher level learning in my discipline, and there isn't science on that yet. So I think that's a place that engineering education has room for research, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to do that. I don't actually know for sure that I've got it down. I don't think I do. I'm experimenting there. So that's an active research project. How would you split the classroom that you IBC? What's IBC? Broadcast it. Ah, how do you flip a class that you are broadcasting? This is a very interesting question. That's truly an online class. So I'm not positive that you can, but here are some observations. The class that I've advertised to you, this Teach Flip MOOC, we had 1,500 people from around the world from K-12 and every discipline in higher ed. And the way we tried to make that more real and active was with the online discussion boards, which is already part of most online courses. But we did see a lot of student interaction. This is faculty interaction through those discussion boards. So I like that. The other thing that we've done with this that worked extremely well is you would watch the material online that's your pre-information. And then at the University of Utah or Salt Lake Community College or University of Wisconsin, they had in-person discussion groups. That's a true flip. So if, for example, you were broadcasting to three campuses and the students got together on those campuses, just have a facilitator and they're going to do the, you essentially do the flip. So that's, that's the best I can offer is online, in-person, or in-person with a facilitator all of which I think is realistic. Uh, near the very beginning of your presentation, you showed a picture that showed Bloom's taxonomy pyramid. And then you showed a pyramid that was some other person's pyramid, like Todd's It's called Dale's Cone. Dale's Cone. I just wanted to However, I hope that you Google Dale's Cone, and I hope you find the Snopes piece about that. Dale's Cone, which says the lecture gives you 5% of your learning, if you really look that up, there's no back, back research behind that. It's probably made up. It makes sense, but it's probably made up. Google Dale's Cone and see what you get. Very good question. From a junior faculty, or in fact a senior faculty, what is the net cost in time? 
Remember, I'm teaching at a 50-minute increment. My videos are going to be 15 to 20 minutes long for each of those 50-minute days. The first time I did this, it took me all afternoon, like four or five hours, to make my first video, learn the technology, get it up on YouTube, get used to hearing my voice, which I hate hearing by video. So it took me all afternoon, and I thought, I can't survive doing this. So I forced myself to become much less perfectionistic. These are not Walt Disney vi quality videos. To get, I mean, if the dog barks, I push the pause button. The students say they love it. I'm doing it on my couch at midnight, probably, making my videos, and the phone may ring, the dog may bark. Push the pause button, carry on. So it took me four or five hours the first time, but with practice, I got, so it took me about an hour to do that 15 to 20 minute segment, get it up online and get it linked to Canvas. But I had to push myself to be non-perfectionistic. So I would say, with practice, it takes an extra hour per lecture day, in addition to whatever other prep you have to do. What happens later, however, so that's the first year. The second year, I'm replacing about 10% of those videos, because they didn't work out, okay? So I fix about 10%. Then the third year, I'm replacing almost none of them. The material that is new is the stuff I'm bringing into class the last 10 minutes anyway. So Ohm's Law hasn't changed in how many decades? Those videos can stay put. Now I'm a vice president at the university. Vice presidents don't have time to teach. I'm still teaching because I want to, and the only way I can survive is because my materials are already made. All of the facts that I want to teach, I know are there, and I can walk into class sh cold with no preparation. Your first year, force yourself to have an extra hour per day of prep for the time you do, and after that, force it to go down. Okay, good questions. One more question. This isn't really a question, but maybe a comment to help. Um, you can do Sorry. the broadcast courses, and it can work very well, but you have to tell the students what you're doing. On day one of my classes, I tell them, this is a flip class, and this is what it means. I'm shifting a lot of the learning to you. You will prepare before you She's saying a very, very good point. What she said is for her broadcast class, it works very well, and she makes sure that she tells the students in advance how they need to prepare, what they need to prepare, and I hope why you are flipping, why you're doing it, and that all the assessments are there and what they mean. I would say that her point is a very, very important. Your students may not have learned this way in the past, it's very important that you clarify your teaching and your reason for it. The first day of class, I have a regular class, I tell the students this is a flipped class, this is why I am doing the flipped class, this is what I expect you to do, this is what I'm going to do, this is what we're going to do when we come into class. You have to teach your students to learn this way. They have to learn how to learn. The fact that it is student-centered and you are putting a lot of the I'm not going to say burden, but opportunity on them to choose what they learn and how they learn is very important for them. You can't just walk into class, slap down a new learning method, and expect that they're good at it. You need to help teach them to learn how to learn this way. And that's a message for all courses in any format. So I appreciate this opportunity to come and talk to you. I will be here afterwards. Just hang out up here if you have further questions. And also, you can find me online, and I love talking about the flip class. So if you would like to have personal interaction, just email me or call me. We live in the same state. Feel free to come down to my class, which won't be until spring. And do feel free to join the Teach Flip program where I'll also be watching all the online discussion boards. I am more than happy to help discuss the issues you may have as you implement this in real time, personally, with you. I am here to help you. So thank you very, very much for this opportunity.